All right, another chapter is cleared. And yeah, the king does absolutely look like a zombie in this game. We cleared chapter 25, Red Lobster. Next is chapter 26, and what is it called? Let me just check, and then I'll update the layout so I don't forget these things. Is it? It's just, it's called Treason. This, that's the chapter that gave me the most difficulty back when. Chapter 26, Treason. It's treason. There we go. Should I put it one more space over? Like that? Would that look nice? Maybe. Maybe one more space over like that. It's treason then. The prince is actually going to finish this stream. All the other blade pieces that I've printed for this, like, I haven't been streaming long enough for them to finish. This is also... Here, take this princess bow. This is also a shorter print, so since it's like the tip, there's not as much to do. But it's over 75% done. It's it's going to finish this stream. I have no doubt. But yeah, yeah, just the tip. Just the tip here. I do want to take some time to talk about like some other stuff going on. Because I do have some other cool things I want to share. Gosh dang it, I'm doing this out of force of habit. But you're maxed out. So there's no point in giving this to my ghost dragon fish anymore. Gosh dang it, man. And there's no way I have any support conversations after that. After that map, do I? I don't think I did any weird new pairings. Let me check. Oh my goodness, I do. I've won between Sophie and Ignatius. They're going to become, like, good friends now. I'll see that in a hot second. Well, I can't invite allies, so I'll do that in a hot second. Because, yeah, there are some other things that I do want to... That I did want to chat about a little bit. So, earlier in the stream, I was mentioning how things were kind of sucking because my truck died. But there's actually some cool things that I have going on that I can, that I can share, too. So, my dad's birthday is coming up towards the end of the month. And around the end of the month, we are going to take the other antique truck in the family, the 1949 Mercury truck, to uh, to a show and shine, is the plan. There's going to be a big event going on there. I can uh, send a picture of it to... Oh, I've already sent pictures of it to myself earlier. Of, let's see here. Maybe... What's a photo that doesn't show, like, any names, like any nameplates on, uh, on the dash for a show and shine event? I guess this doesn't. Yeah. Here. This thing where Bob here. The... This truck. Because after we got it from my grandpa, like, it was encountering quite a few issues. We had to spend about a year, like, fixing it up. It was finally drivable again last year. And then, uh... We took it to a couple shows last year. Not all that much. We want to start doing more this year. Yeah, it's really cool. It's really fancy. And we want to start doing more with it. Because it's been sitting around not doing much for a decent few years now. So, because my dad's birthday is coming up, and this is his truck, so mine is like the broken down Fargo <laughs> that I was chatting about earlier. Hello, hello, true to fruit. Not much is going on. I'm just giving like story updates of things going on here in life now that we've cleared this chapter, and then I'll play the next one shortly. But anyway, since we want to start bringing this to more events, and since we're taking it to one at the end of the month, and since my dad's birthday is coming up, I got an art piece commissioned of this truck here which I just picked up earlier today. It's beside me here. So uh, there is this one art studio that I found out about when there was like a sale going on. <laughs> you can see this other thing in general, Games of Planet Fragapalooza 2024, just notes I make to myself, um, where I saw at this art sale like last year at my university campus, this one studio that does this thing where they'll take like a Hot Wheels car and they'll glue it onto a canvas and draw like kind of like a cool trail effect and these watercolor kind of looks of like a trail behind the vehicle that's really cool. I thought like, man, wouldn't something like that be really cool for one of the old vehicles? I drive a 1953 Fargo or 1953 Dodge. It's the same thing. Unfortunately, there's no Hot Wheels of that kind of thing, but there just so happens to be Hot Wheels of a 1949 Ford, which is the same as a 49 Mercury. Like it's the same thing, like different name, but the exact same brand. So a while back, my cousin's younger kid and I took a couple of those Hot Wheels that I ordered in specially and painted them to be the colors of that truck. So here's one that I just have loosely. And the other one is the one that I gave to that artist that I had commissioned this piece. So I'll give this to my dad sometime later in the month. But I just picked up this earlier today. And I think that it looks really cool. So there's the other one that was painted. Either me or my cousin's kid did that. I don't know which is which. I did one, she did one. I don't know which. But I think it turned out pretty cool. You can see the light that I have there just behind the monitor. 
So it's uh, so this is what I picked up earlier today to be specifically for this truck. Yeah, and I think that it'll be like a really nice gift for him. Like I hope that he really likes it. So this will uh, this will be that, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what his reaction is to this. So when we go to a show at the at the end of the month, we'll probably take this with us, and then we can put it like in the cab or open the hood and rest it on the engine or something like that, and then people that are going through the show and browsing vehicles can see this right next to the vehicle that it's all about. The vehicle is painted to look just like it. Even, gosh dang, I'm holding it on the wrong side. So, that was really neat. That was really neat there. You can even hang it, because it has that there. So, I'm just gonna leave it in the bag here for the most part for now, but I did want to show that this stream, because I think it's really, really cool. So, yeah, that'll, uh, That'll be fun to give him there. And then another thing is we wanted to print out a sign for this truck so that when we go to a show and shine or something like that, we can just set up a sign in front of it that says the vehicle stats and the story behind it because we've seen people have that at shows and thought like, hey, it'd be really cool to get a sign made for this truck. So my mom had sent me a just document where here i could probably show the actual original document where it was just a word document that was thrown together no it wasn't through uh it wasn't through email i can't actually grab it it was on a usb stick that i don't have i guess i can't show the original document but <laughs> use your imagination i threw it into my graphic design software and i i'll probably just open this in browser it's way too tiny otherwise if i open it in discord if i do it like this so i was just given this Microsoft Word document where it's just like type like what the truck is at the top here's all the stats and then here's the long story about it and there's like a couple pictures but just like on a generic gray background on a Microsoft Word document and like a very typical like standard Word doc looking thing it didn't look all that nice as a sign so I decide to kind of spruce it up here a little bit there was two different backgrounds that I was electing for maybe I'll actually pull up the other one because the uh, because the one that I did just pull up there kind of doxes where my late cabin is at, and let's not do that. So this one doesn't dox me, so yeah, let's do this one, even though this isn't the final version, where this is what I designed here. Hey, look, there's a whole bunch of, like, playlists and things there of stuff. I'm just, I, I don't know. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to tell you. But here, if we turn this off for a hot second here. I can zoom in. So I decided to browse around some of the signs I took pictures of at a show that I was at in Texas when I was down there uh, about a month and a half ago now, something like that. And there was this one that had like a PNG of the truck itself that was on top of like a semi-transparent background that listed some of the information. I was like, that's really cool. I want to do that. So that's why I did. Oh, I guess this also isn't like the final final thing. Like I changed this to like an uppercase U later, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, so I got this thrown together where it's like, here's a PNG of the truck with like my dad in it looking happy. Here it is in front of the lake front with like the lake frozen back there. This was from this last winter because it no snow stayed on the ground until the new year. So we actually had this in front of the frozen lake. We normally wouldn't drive it during winter. And here was Canada Day Parade last year. So there's me. <laughs> Here's me just hanging out in the back. My dad driving it where, like, the flag is blocking him and stuff. Uh, I appreciate you saying so. So, I sent this to my dad earlier. I haven't seen him today. He was already out of town. So, I hope that he likes it too. So, I'll try to get this printed on, like, a big poster board and get it put together on a, on a sign here. And in case anyone is curious and wants to pause and, like, read stuff here later, this is, like, the story that he wrote of it. And... <laughs> Yeah, I think that it should look pretty nice as a uh, as a sign here. So there's a place on campus where you can get stuff like that printed. And I had one printed earlier today, but they got my order wrong and they printed the uh, they didn't print it in the right way. So now they have to redo it. So I'll pick it up next week. So we'll take that to this show and have a nice sign in the front. And we'll take the canvassy art commissioned thing, whatever you want to call it, the driving painting thing. So. Yeah, there's not so great news in regards to my old truck, but there's some pretty cool exciting news in regards to my dad's old truck, at least. So, at least there's cool stuff going on for one old truck, even if not for both. But yeah, 
What's your other gang printed on? I believe it was a satin photo paper. And that was what they printed, but they were supposed to mount it to a coroplast, I believe it was. And they didn't mount it to a coroplast. And they were just gonna give me like the tube, like the big roll of the thing. And I was like, huh, this isn't what I ordered. I wanted it mounted to the thing. And they were like, oh yeah, whoops. I guess we'll have to reprint it. And you're probably gonna want to make the borders bigger because uh, because they were saying that when they put it on the coroplast and then they cut out the borders, there's going to be like a decent bit of the border cut off. So they told me to just like go change it, make the border a little bit thicker, like this black area so that it doesn't cut into like the red here when they do that. So I went back to my office on campus. I made this like a decent smidge thicker. I did what they told me to and sent it like back to them in the email of like where they'd emailed me before of like your order confirmation. I sent it back to them and said like, hey, here's the updated thing. And they didn't respond to that. They didn't say that they were working on it. They didn't say received or anything. And I'm concerned, but I'll follow up about it next week and see what's going on there. Like, it's not a rush. This will be at the end of the month that this needs to be done. So it's not a major rush and they usually get it done like same day there. So if I need to figure it out next week, then I'll figure it out next week. And it's not a super big deal. But yeah, it should look really nice. And it'll be really cool having this sign and this and this canvas here. So should be it should be pretty neat and then maybe we'll mount that core plus like a wooden plank or something on the bottom to keep it in place or just get like another core plus sheet to mount to the back and then put like a hinge so i can fold out into a v and stand up like that or something i don't know i'll figure it out maybe do some arts and crafts and do some cool stuff for that so those both together i guess will be like a little bit of a birthday present for my dad you could say so so that's neato there and that was a thing that i wanted to share some updates as of today and then the other cool thing because i uh i sometimes give a lot of life updates in some of my playthroughs at least my long playthroughs that are going on across a long period of time and that's definitely assassin's creed odyssey and fire emblem is another one of them so i usually like to try and give like updates to different life stuff when i'm shooting fire emblem so here's cool stuff that was going on with grafting recently because i haven't streamed this in a little while and this is probably new to this series i think I was experimenting around with grafting this year, and one of my plum grafts is already flowering, so it might get fruit this year, despite the fact that this little stick only just healed on, like, not that long ago, so that's pretty neat. Still a very young tree here, and I put on a few different things, and they're growing like crazy. And this image was from, like, a few weeks ago now, so who knows how big this is by now. Like, it's insane. This one hasn't grown as much. This is the one that's going crazy. Was grafting when you combine two plants together. So... Essentially, I wonder if I have any pictures of my process here. Let's see, I can post some pictures of my process because I was doing some earlier today. So you can combine two different varieties or two different species as long as they're genetically close enough. And then and when you combine them, so you can see the bandage here, they'll, they'll both realize, huh, I'm injured. I should heal. What's this other piece? This seems pretty similar to me. I'm going to heal to that. And then they fuse together and they become one thing but the two grafted things will remain true to their type. So this is, I don't know what type of plum this is. It's just whatever grew here from the roots of the old plum tree. But this is a pempina plum. So this tree here will make the plums of the type of tree it is, but any branches grown from this will make pempina plums. Any plums grown from branches that this generates will become Seneca plums because this is a Seneca plum stick. Any not plums that grow from this will actually be plum apricot hybrids is what this actually is, which is apparently, according to the internet, more apricot-like, but with plum aftertaste, is what I hear according to the internet. And if I get some to pick later this year, I'll see what that's like. But I was doing some earlier today. July is apparently the latest that you can do it. So I can just post, like, an example of a cleft graft here, which is all I've been doing. Let's see. So one good example of that would probably be this set of three. Yeah, so I'll post that into plants and then scroll to the bottom. So if I press this, my hotkey to turn that on and off and scroll to the bottom. This is like what I did earlier today. So I go to the parent tree, cut off a branch horizontally like that. Take my knife, cut into it like that to make a V. Take this stick from a completely different type of tree. Cut it down to a point. Shove it in there so that there's contact between what's called the cambium layers, which is where the tree like transports nutrients and all that. So make sure there's contact between the cambium on both them. Then wrap it in grafting tape so that it seals in any moisture. So because this doesn't have any roots of its own until it heals. So 
seal in the moisture so that it doesn't dry out and die before it heals. And then I just put on a little bit of electrical tape just so that the grafting tape doesn't fall off, so it just keeps it in place. And you can see that this stick is starting to wake up. It's been in my fridge for a while. This is a September ruby apple, and this is my almost crab apple tree. Because crab apples, they're not exactly very nice. My Oma grew this tree from a seed. It's really cool. It's a really nice, pretty tree. But what are you going to use crab apples for? I made some crab apple muffins last year, but the thing is covered in crab apples, and crab apples are just kind of not super great. So if I put other apple types on here, I'll get some tastier fruit. But yeah. No, that would be through uh, crossbreeding would be the case. You put a stick on there, and it'll just make purely like what it is. So this is a September ruby apple stick put onto a crab apple. It will only make September Ruby. Yeah, that's a thing that you can do. It's been around for like, it's one of those things that's been around since like forever, but it's a pretty niche kind of thing. And it makes you wonder who's like the first person that discovered that this was a thing that's possible. So yeah, this is the crab apple. This is a September Ruby stick. So this branch, when it grows into a branch, this is a tiny stick right now, but as it grows over years into a full branch, if this works here, then this will only make pure September Ruby apples. Just like the main tree here will only still make crab apples, since that's what it was programmed to do genetically. Like, the DNA in this stick tells it to make September ruby apples, so that's what it's going to do. It's not going to be like a hybrid. If you wanted to hybridize them, you would have to cross-pollinate them and then get the seeds from the new thing and then plant the seeds, and then you would have like a new hybrid. That way is the case. So, this was one of the graphs that I put on here. Yes, you can indeed. And that's what I want to do with this tree. This is only my first time grafting. I wanted to uh, just kind of practice this year. So most of my grafts failed. Like I might not have done it right. And maybe I should just switch to a different layout here where it's a little bit easier. Here, let's see here. And then display capture from here. Yes, you can indeed. And I want to slowly turn this tree into a multi-variety tree. Like put one or two new things on like every year and just turn it into like a whole multi-colored mishmash of different apples and stuff. So this is another one. This is a red wonder apple and a red wonder apple is one that's red on the inside. I can find a picture of it here. Whoops, read wonder apple, red wonder apple. It's like one of my favorite kinds of apples. It's so cool. It looks like this. Apparently it's really popular in ciders because then you get like natural red coloring without needing to add anything artificial to turn the cider red. So apparently it's really popular in that. The only one that I ate, it tasted kind of sweet. I liked it. But I only ate one, and they're smaller apples, so I don't have the best frame of reference here. But at this grafting event that I went to to buy sticks, there was Red Wonder sticks. I was like, oh, I gotta buy a Red Wonder stick. So I bought a Red Wonder stick. I grafted it on there. You can see how, like, here's the color of the crab apple, where it's this light brown kind of bark. And then the Red Wonder is this super dark, like, completely different thing. And the leaves are completely different, too, where it's like, this is a crab apple leaf. This is a Red Wonder Leaf, and they're kind of fuzzy. They're kind of fuzzy and interesting feeling. So, yeah, this is starting to grow into its own branch. And if it becomes like a significant part of the tree, it becomes like a pretty decent branch. That'd be great. You can see there was another one that I did here. This one didn't work. This one didn't grow. So I guess I didn't do it right. I'm still a beginner to this. This is only my first year grafting, so most of mine have failed. But this one worked, and I'm really hyped that this crab apple tree is going to start growing apples that look like this as this branch continues to grow. That'll be really, really nice. And September ruby apples too, because one of my ones that I did like way earlier took. I put like four or five different things on this tree this year, and only two things took, this and the September ruby. And the things I was showing pictures of trying to do here earlier today is other spare September ruby sticks that I had where they were starting to open up, so I saw they were still alive, and I was like, oh, let's just try putting it on and see if it works, and I'll see if in a few weeks it continues to grow or if it dries out and dies. We'll see. So there was that. I grafted to the plum tree out at the lake because we used to have two plum trees. One of them got eaten by a porcupine and died. The other one just never seemed to do all that well and died. And you can see the stump of this old one here. But this one is a kind that suckers from the bottom. It sends up new trees. So this is a new tree that grew from the roots of the old tree here. And I have no idea what this is because a lot of nurseries will actually graft. They'll put whatever fruit you want on the top, and then the roots will be whatever is like the best roots for like that kind of tree is the case. Have a different scion and a different rootstock. So if it was like that and the top was different than the bottom through grafting on the original tree that was here, then this is not even the same type as the tree that we planted here. It's whatever the roots are 
and it's still a young tree. It hasn't flowered, it hasn't produced any fruit yet. And I have no idea what kind of plum it is. I just know it's a plum tree, but it probably can't pollinate itself because there's only one of it. And most plum types can't pollinate each other. This type here, Seneca, it can pollinate itself, apparently. But most need two different types to pollinate itself. But if I just put multiple things on it, then it'll pollinate itself because there's all this genetic diversity. But yeah, had a plum tree in your childhood home, didn't produce a single plum in the entire decade that you lived there. Oh, geez. It could have been an ornamental plum, or it could have been that it needed a different plum to pollinate it, potentially. Because that's nature's way of forcing diversity is, hey, we need two genetically distinct things to come together to make new seeds, so that the seeds are for sure a brand new variety, and then that's forced genetic diversity and helps with evolution and all that. So, like, Pempina needs a, a different type of plum to pollinate it. The other tree that died was a Pempina plum, and so I wanted Pempina plums again, and now we're getting Pempina plums again, which is really nice. So, looking forward to eating those again one day. And this tree should hopefully pollinate the flowers that appear on here. I was surprised when two flowers appeared on here. I don't know if there's anything nearby that can pollinate it. If anyone else has like a plum or an apricot tree in the village. Maybe, hopefully. I'll find out the next time I'm out there and see if there's little fruits. Or my parents are out there right now. I can just send a text and say, hey, are there tiny little apra plums or ap plum cots or whatever the heck on there? Whatever you want to call them. Pluots. There's so many different names for them. But it's a plum apricot hybrid. So you can combine different species if they're close enough. So on a plum tree, you can put on apricots, peaches, nectarines, sometimes cherries, because they're all stone fruits. On citrus trees, you can combine different citrus. So you can combine like lime, lemon, and oranges onto one tree. But yeah, yeah, not right now. It would have to be tomorrow <laughs> would be the case. But I would be, uh, I would be curious to know if we would get some fruit this year. But one of my crazy things that I was posting earlier, like just a couple days ago, these are my tomatoes, and they are massive. So they're called tomatoes because they're a combination of tomato and potato. So I had a whole bunch of tomato plants that were growing nice, big, and strong, and then I put some potato tubers in these buckets to just grow into potato plants, and they did. They made all these potato stalks, and then when they were a decent size, I cut off all the potato stalks, I cut some branches off my tomato plants, and I shoved them in the potato stalks and they grew. And now it's like this crazy bushy thing that looks like this and it is growing faster than my actual tomato plants. So it looks just like a massive tomato, but underground it's potato. So it'll make fruit above ground and underground it'll make potatoes. And it is going crazy. It has just started to make like the first tomatoes just over here and there's flowers appearing everywhere. So it'll start to make a lot more tomatoes. And hopefully, at the end of the season, when it's time to pull this up from the ground, there will be potatoes under here. That's the hope. <laughs> we shall, uh, we shall see. I mean, you can kind of see here where they're grafted together, where it's like, this is a potato stalk here, and then that's a tomato stalk. And I had to label them for all the different tomato types, because I put multiple different tomato types on each potato. So here's like some yellow tomatoes. I shoved two tomatoes in this one, and it took. There's an indigo rose, which is a type of black tomato better bush, a type of red one, another yellow one here in the middle, and then I put a beefsteak one here, which is a massive tomato, which I don't know if it'll have the energy to produce that, because producing both tomatoes and potatoes takes a lot of energy. So, apparently I shouldn't expect the yield to be super high. It's 85% done on the print. So, that is the that is the grafting updates there. There's this one tomato plant at my Oma's place that is now getting ready to develop tomatoes on the roof of the garage. It is insane. It's got flowers up there now, and it... Craziness. I'll be the only one that can actually reach those tomatoes. And yeah, this has been updates in the plant stuff. Oh, and here's the September Ruby graft on the backside that took with, like, the camera out of focus. This one leaf is bigger now, but yeah, this one took. But most of them didn't. And there was the red apple when it first... Or red wonder apple when it first started to open, and I was all excited, like, Whoa! I did it! I combined them! So, yeah, I think... I think every year, and there's my house caps at work that I was taking home to start giving some away. So I think now that I know that there's a grafting event where people just go to like sell their sticks of different cool types of fruits, I'm probably going to go there every year and try to get like two or three new things to add to the apple tree every year. Because I don't want to overstress it by putting like too much on at once, like taking off too much of its old growth and replacing it with other types. But if I just do like two or three a year and then slowly develop that tree into a multi-variety apple type 
Like, it's already got three kinds. Crab Apples, September Ruby, and now Red Wonder. Like, it has those three that I... Like, the original one, and then the two that I put on. So, it's really cool that even if a fruit tree has a fruit that you really don't like, just put on varieties that you do like. No problem. Then it's no worries. So, my apple trees that I'm growing from seed right now, if it turns out that the new varieties that I'm making are just really crap and just awful apples, I can still use the trees. I can just graft other things to them. And then the roots are still going to good use, and it's not like a waste growing them from seed all that time. Like, it still goes to good use. And my Oma grew the crab apple tree from a seed just for the fun of it and planted in the yard. But again, what are you going to use crab apples for? But it's still a useful tree because I can actually grow delicious apples off of it because I know how to now. So that's cool. So that's been my recent grafting experiments I want to share. But there was one development today that was really, really exciting because I'm trying to grow a lot of things from seed, a lot of fruit trees from seed. Where, what are all the fruit trees I've, I have grown from seed now? There's my apples, two different types of new hybrid apples. There's Nanking cherries more recently. There's my lime trees. I have orange trees at work. There's hazelnut trees that aren't quite from seed. They were from cuttings, but they're still just tiny little things. Um, I have another type of cherry. That one's also not from seed, a different type of sour cherry from my Oma's yard. Point is, I have a lot of fruit trees in pots around here and at work. So that's six different kinds. But now it's up to seven, because this little pot earlier today that I've had outside, I couldn't help but notice when I checked it earlier today, I was checking just to see if it needed any water. And all of a sudden, I noticed that there was something sticking out. And what this is, the apricot. <laughs> That's what it is, which a lot of people like that I've talked to about, like just growing apricots here find it surprising that apricots can grow in central Alberta at all. Like, it's not one of the things that you would think would be something that can grow here. But nope. Apparently apricots can grow here, just a very select few kinds. So I couldn't just go to the store and get, like, an apricot and seed it and plant that. Because it's probably from who knows where warmer climate and it wouldn't be able to grow here. It wouldn't survive the winters. So it took me a while to find apricot seeds. But I found some in March, I think it was. I found some seeds in March from this one seller at like a seed event where there were all these cool seeds being sold. Being stolen? Being sold, my goodness gracious. Where they set up this gumball machine where like you put in a toonie and you get out a big gumball. Except they filled it full of capsules that all have fruit tree seeds. So like you put in a toonie and you twist it and then a capsule comes out with a fruit tree seed of some sort of unconventional fruit that grows here, that was harvested from stuff that grows here, and it comes with instructions on the inside of if there's any steps you need to do to try and grow it. And they said that, like, the twisting it and the whole gumball machine was just kind of for fun. Like, if any adults wanted a specific thing that was in there, you could just give them a toonie and they take off the lid and give you the specific thing you want. But I was like, you know, I'm gonna try my chances and, like, see what I get here. And I put in a toonie, and I twisted it, and I got a little capsule out, and there was two apricot pits in it. I was like, oh, this is actually what I wanted to get anyway. This kind of this kind of works out. So I got two apricot pits, and it turns out it's a lot harder to grow them than just putting them in the ground and giving them water. You can't just do that. Because the pits of stone fruits are really, really hard. And it was really amazing. It was so cool. I'd never seen anything like it. The pits are really hard. Where was that? I don't remember. I'd be able to tell you if I looked at my camera roll but I'd also rather not be doxing <laughs> the exact locations I've been to on stream. I guess apart from things like Fragapalooza where it's obvious where that is because that's posted online. But some community center place where there was like a seed exchange going on. I just looked up seed exchanges and uh, there's stuff like that that goes on early in the year for the season where people want to get like cool new seeds and all that. Um, but anyway, it turns out you can't just plant the pit and expect it to grow because the pit is so hard protecting the seed inside that it is meant to make the seed travel extremely far and experience potentially years worth of erosion until the pit cracks enough that the seed inside gets moisture and can start to grow. So it's the way that nature has designed it to ensure that these trees are going super far before they grow. It's not going to be nearby. It's going to get eroded by so much travel, which is actually kind of cool. So, I've seen some guides online recommend that you crack open pits and take out the seed inside. I tried that with a plum once, it just broke the seed. And that's not what would happen naturally. Just breaking the pit open completely. So what I did is, I took the pits, and I took the file on my multi-tool here. 
And where is the file? It was this part here. I took my file. I took the pits. And I just scraped there while watching YouTube for so long, mimicking years worth of erosion within the span of like an hour until there was holes in each of the pits so that water could get through. I soaked them in water so they would start to absorb some moisture. And I put them in my fridge for three months to mimic winter because stuff like that is evolved to wait until a cold period has passed before they sprout to guarantee that they sprout during spring. Because otherwise, if they sprout in like summer or fall and then have part of a season and then get snowed on, then they're probably going to die because they're not established enough yet. So they wait until it's for sure spring. So I had them in my fridge for three months to convince them it was winter when it wasn't really. If it was still winter outside in March, I would have just put them outside and they could have done it naturally. But it wasn't quite that time. I wanted to sprout these sooner, so I put them in my fridge for three months. I only took them out a week and a half ago? Something like that? Maybe two weeks ago? After it had been exactly three months and, like, they were ready for planting. So, I filled the container here. I put one pit on either side, so who knows, the second one might come up yet. And after... Yeah, it's a complicated process to do it. Like uh, you would think, just pit in the ground, give it water, and it would grow. But nope, you gotta you gotta wear it down, gotta give it moisture, gotta make it winter, whether that's actually naturally outside or just in the fridge. Take it out, and then you can plant it. And I wasn't sure after all those steps, like, hey, will it work? Will I be able to do it? But hey, I have my seed-grown apricot. So I didn't see this up yesterday. It only I only just noticed it earlier today. So it's still extremely extremely young. I'm growing an apricot from a seed and one that was like from a f apricot tree that was here in the in the same city so I know it can live in this climate so I'm kind of looking forward to growing my own apricot tree from seed and planting that one day and being able to pick apricots from it is the case so yeah so that would explain that you for cherries you might not need to like do the scarifying of scraping them down but I do need the cold period is the case I sprouted several Nanking cherries where I just had them in the fridge for X period of time I have a whole bunch in the other room there I could always grab some <laughs> I have five extra now I think basically because I got a whole bunch that came up <laughs> was kind of the case where I had them in the fridge for three months and after a couple months some of the pits started to open up and you could see like a root coming out more more specifically I would have them in a damp paper towel in the fridge to kind of mimic soil, to make them think that they're in soil and there's a little bit of moisture that they can pick up. And then they think it's winter and after X amount of chill hours, they're like, okay, it's gotta be spring here soon. Now it's time to grow. If it's just warm, then they're like, all right, who knows when winter's gonna hit? Let's just not grow for safety. We'll grow after winter is hit and then, then we're good. That's what I had to do with my apple trees as well. I have seven apple trees that I've grown from seed that are struggling with spider mite issues but I'm trying to I'm trying to alleviate it I had those seeds in the fridge for three months is what I did and then one of which came from a red wonder apple one of those sets of seeds it was at one point they're all out now I think I had in there in this last batch apricots nanking cherries saskatoons elderberries and oso berries is what was all in there but there have been spans before that I've had like my apple seeds in there along with I don't know what else I don't think I had my mulline in there. Mulline I just had in a pot outside to do it naturally. I've had gooseberry seeds in the fridge at one point to stratify it is the name of the technique. I never got any of my gooseberries to come up though, so can't seem to do gooseberries from seed. I was told that I'd have to do the same for hascaps. I have a few hascaps here in a baggie, the last few to munch on. Um, I heard that with hascaps, you might need to do that as well to grow some hascap bushes from seed, but you might not have to if you just put them right in the right in soil after taking them out of the berry. And that's what I did, and they all grew. So I guess I didn't really need to do that for hascaps. Otherwise, I would have put hascap seeds in the fridge. And I do have more hascap seeds now around, so if I ever want to grow more from seed, I can do that. What are those? Hascaps? They're a type of honeysuckle. They kind of look like long blueberries. And their their taste is kind of a mix of sweet and tart. These ones are a little bit smushed. They're a little bit messy, so they'll probably never become commercialized because of that. They look like this. this. Is what they look like. They're basically like long blueberries. And they taste really good. <laughs> is the uh, is the case? They're they're starting to gain more and more popularity, but they are still a pretty niche fruit because like you'll never see it in the supermarket or anything. 
but the plants are hardy down to like minus 50 and the flowers are hardy down to minus seven so if a late frost comes in they're just like i don't give a shit and they just bake fruit anyway <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't make them lose their flowers so they are so i guess they're like one of the few fruits that can grow all the way in zone one like they they just don't really care about the cold at all they're amazing and uh the leaves are slightly fuzzy they're kind of fun there they're really well-behaved plants. They don't sucker, so they don't send up any additional plants from the ground. They don't have any spikes. They're kind of woody to the touch. So they're very well-behaved, well-mannered plants in that sense where... I forgot I didn't have that on again. I believe that they were originally native to Siberia, I think I remember reading, and that's why they'd be, like, so cold-resistant. And it took a long time of breeding, mostly done by the University of Saskatchewan, to get them to the point that they were tasty enough to start putting out there. And now they're gaining like more and more popularity every day. I only found out about them last year and now they're like my current craze. <laughs> this is kind of the case. The guy that was helping me with my truck the other day, one of the things that we were talking about a little bit was Hascaps. <laughs> and turns out he likes growing Hascaps too. That would be the Master Sword is what's being printed. This right here that's kind of being blocked by my apricot right now is the case. But let's see here. Like... If I pull this up, these are my seed grown hascaps on my desk at work. I was getting like a last few photos of them all together, I think is what this was. Yeah, because I started to bring some home and give some away was the case. But they look kind of like this. But imagine this becoming like a big bush eventually. These are less than a year old because I've been growing them from seed as of last year. But just imagine these bushing out and becoming like a crazy mass and making berries like that. And they're delicious and they are not going to care about the cold at all, and it is amazing. So, how you would spell it would be like this. But yeah, they're great plants. You can sometimes find them at some greenhouses as they're getting more and more popular. There have been some greenhouses that I've went to where in like the bush section, they'll have like a couple house caps. I got my original plants from a farm, like a decent bit out of town, and then I just grew a whole bunch of my own from seed, which, Seems iffy about whether you're even supposed to be allowed to do that or not, but shh. It's, uh, that's neither here nor there. So, yeah, and they're they're fun plants. And now I have a whole bunch planted in the yard here. Do be the case. They're developing their first fruit this year. The ones I bought off the farm last year that were already like two-year-old plants when I bought them. Those have some fruit on them, so I've been munching here and there. And they're pretty tasty. These house cups were from a co-worker that I helped graft because she is some super big established bushes. And yeah, so I think that's pretty much the truck updates and the plant updates that I wanted to do during this stream to stream is kind of the case. Let's do a support conversation now and see what the heck is going on here. That's my oblig obligatory life update ramble that I do during Assassin's Creed Odyssey and Fire Emblem and sometimes Pokemon Mystery Dungeon. Ignatius, don't move. What? What is it? Stay calm. Don't move. And I got it. I really don't want to know, but I have to ask. What did you just pluck off of my back? It's nothing, just a tiny caterpillar. But I know how you dislike bugs. Yeah, get her away, get her away! Calm down, I'll set it down over here. Yeesh, you've really got to work on this bug phobia thing. How do you say that? I'm not that scared of bugs. Why don't you go pick up that caterpillar with your bare hand? Gods, no! I think I finally understand you, Ignatius. How do you mean? Well, you don't show a lot of emotions with your face, but I can see you feel things deeply. Well, of course. That's not all. I always see you on the front lines in battle, but I know battle terrifies you. You must really treasure your friends to put yourself in the line of fire like that. Well, I don't know. And you're also really modest. If you say so. <laughs> see? You're making such a scary face, but I can tell you're happy. You're quite perceptive. Maybe you do understand me. Be one of the first. There we go, there's support conversation. Most Frank Blues exactly heard about it from a friend, but it didn't really explain it much. It is a LAN party that goes on for four days here. Do uh no, I don't have a tab open for that still. Here, let me do this layout, maybe. Oh, let's have the chat glitch out there. Display capture, and then the print can be going on above there. It's a four-day land gaming event that goes on in the Leduc Rec Center. It's August 8th to 11th this year. I'm gonna just look up Fragapalooza and go to their site. So, the gym space, or well, one of the many gym spaces in the LRC, Leduc Rec Center, 
is just filled with people, usually several hundred here. We'll see if this ends up getting filled up more here. But this is a gym space here in the Leduc Rec Center. And these are the seats. If you buy a ticket to Fragapalooza, you get like a table spot. I grabbed this one right next to the stage so that it's easy to run my Smash tournaments and stuff this year. And at the table space, you get, I believe it's three power outlets, an ethernet cable, and then that table spot. And it's like, do with it what you please. It's expected that you bring in your own computer, like, which most people will just bring like their full on desktops and a monitor. And uh, yeah, it's almost done here. That makes me wonder if I should start printing something else this stream because there'll still be time. Yeah, you bring in your desktop, you bring in a monitor. I think streamers like me that are streaming stuff for the event can bring in two, but you're, but most people are recommended to just bring one because the power draw when this many people are in here. I mean, we'll see if the seats fill up a little bit more. I do hope they fill up more. Like the, uh, the red seats are all the taken ones. Do be the case. And then just game there for like four days from Thursday to Sunday is the case. Some people go home during the nights and just sleep there. Other people have like places booked to be able to go and sleep. Some people just move their chair back and sleep in their chair. Some people like me sleep in their vehicle is the case. You sit in game and there's events and stuff that go on. Also, do I have a way up? There was one I had my tent in the back of the truck. There's all the carburetors up here. It was this is why I did a Fragapalooza last year. I just slept in the back of my truck. This is what I did in the tent. It was amazing. It, uh, it was actually really comfortable. Two hundred nine seats so far. Wait, for like booked? There's no way all the red adds up to 290. You probably just mean like how many are available here. And these are only going to be used if like it comes down to it. This is always selected as like overflow for like if we get filled here, then we'll go into these rows. These aren't available otherwise because it's meant for overflow. Um, but there's events and stuff. I'm the guy that runs the Smash tournaments. And there's a lot of four fun events as well. Like we usually have like rock, paper, scissors tournaments or only early birds can select seats at the moment. Okay, I gotcha. So that's why it looks like there's a whole bunch of gap. Well, I really got to tell my cousin's younger kid to move over already. I've already told her twice and she still hasn't done it. My cousin's older kid used to be here, but he moved out to go be with friends after you found out that they were coming. So, and I, I told my cousin's younger kid, like either move next to me or move next to your brother or move next to your dad. I, I don't care. It doesn't matter. But if this is just filled up with like some rando and we're separated like that, it's going to be really weird. So you should probably move over and she still hasn't done it. <laughs> I'll have to just tell her again or something like that. Anyway. Yeah, there's all sorts of for fun events. Like there's usually rock, paper, scissors tournaments. Sometimes there's paper airplane contests as well, where they'll just make announcements on the stage like, there's this going on right now, like paper airplanes over in the hallway. And then you go out into the hallway and I have sheets of paper for everyone and you can fold it up and just try to see how far you can get. The rules had to be changed after one year where I think someone just crumpled it up into a ball and just chucked it. So the rules have needed to be, oh, that's the wrong thing. The, uh, the rules have needed to be updated to, it has to resemble an airplane and it's at the discretion of the judges, essentially. Yep, you get it for all four days. That's your table. That's your spot. You bring your setup and you just game there for four days. And there will be people here to like make sure that no one's like sneaking out any equipment. You, where's my switch? Oh, I think my switch is in my, like my work bag. But you can get stickers put onto your expensive equipment like monitors and like computer and stuff like that. I'm sure I have stickers on the back of these monitors here that have like your frag ID. So whenever anybody's leaving with any expensive equipment, they make sure that the ID on the sticker is the same as your frag ID to make sure that no one's stealing anything. We've never really had any major issues with theft. Like with my Smash tournaments that I do, I'll just leave the controllers out and go do other things. I've never had a controller stolen or anything like that. I thought I did last year, but it turned out Guzma had it all along, but I thought it was stolen, but it was accounted for luckily. But anyway, I run the uh, the Smash tournaments. Here's my playlist for Fragapalooza last year, so you can get kind of an idea. Guzma picked up in this elite trainer box, and he was like, oh, how about we do an unboxing on stream? So that's what we did. So you might be able to see a little bit of the venue here. So yeah, here's the Leduc Rec Center in the background there. And this is still at like the beginning of the events. So you can see people here like getting their computers set up, getting ready to game. Here's Guzma and I like big chilling out. I was wearing my glasses. I was in nerd mode and we were doing Pokemon card stuff. I've only done like twice on this channel, I think. So there's that. And then if we go to the Smash tournaments, it looks like we were playing some Octopath Traveler. Yeah, and then here's the Smash tournaments. I'm the guy that runs the Smash tournaments if you want to come and play in Smash. 
but my setup was pretty far from from the actual stage where it was being run. So you can see me kind of coming back to my setup here to commentate. So I come all the way over here. This is the free-for-all tournament. We have a free-for-all tournament, a doubles tournament, and a singles tournament. So there's something for everyone. There's the free-for-all mash and have fun. Anyone can, like, do pretty decently well and have fun there. There's the 2v2s where it's like, hey, a big local LAN event like this, go make a new friend, have fun. Why is this display capture zoomed in? This one, that's a normal thing, geez. Um, go make a new friend or play with an existing friend and then the singles for those that actually want to play like super competitively and push their skill. So yeah, here I was just like commentating for the Smash tournaments and then the stage all the way over there that people were playing. I didn't have any tournament organizers to help me out. So after, after the game was done, I would... I would get up and I would go back over to the stage and get the next game set up. It was it was a little bit of a mess. I think someone was coming and asking me about the tournaments or something there. So I got up, I head back over this way. <laughs> it was the case. Uh, and here's the next thing. Next game was set up. It was ready to go underway. But now this year, this year being right next to the stage, it's gonna be so much smoother, I think. I could have gone into the Fragapalooza friends and family area. That's what I was in last year. But this, this is gonna be so much easier for running the tournaments, holy crap. So the stage was also being used for a decent bit of the event last year. So I only got the stage for free for all and then the final games of singles. And my stream, like my stream here was only set up connected by cable to the stage. It wasn't set up to the little impromptu area that was uh, that was set up. If I go to where I was chatting with the uh, frag president here, just to pull up a picture, this is a, uh, this is the setup that was here last year. And it blocked a major lane for traffic, like both coming this way and this way. It looks like the up and down is this side this year. So that's a little bit better, but Still, it sounds like I could use that area again this year if I wanted, but I think I'm going to be good just figuring it out in this area. Like, if people need to play at, like, my desk, then fine, whatever. But, and it sounds like the uh, stage doesn't really have much booked this year, apart from the opening ceremonies and the closing ceremonies. Yeah, they might slot other things in. So it sounds like I can just have the stage when I want to, when I want to use it. So I'll do the Smash Free For Alls on Thursday, and then doubles and singles I'll do on this Saturday. I, last year I had free for all Thursday, doubles Friday, and then singles on singles on Saturday. But then when I found out that Overwatch was going on on Friday, I lost all my players because everyone was playing in Overwatch and we had to reschedule it to Saturday. Seating is on GTD, then seating here is where you find it. And then you can find like the floor plan. And if you click 23 in here, you find me is the case. Sorry, you are wrong, clan. Oh, for, like, reserving a seat and stuff. Then I gotcha. In that a case. But yeah, so... Like, there's all sorts of tournaments. There's going to be an Overwatch tournament for sure. I think there's going to be a Counter-Strike tournament as well. I don't think it's posted yet. But why am I opening a new tab? I can just... Do this. Um... So I think the only one that's posted right now is... Overwatch. Like, we're still figuring out the exact time slots that my Smash tournaments are going to go on. I can confirm to you that Smash is going on, because I'm the one running it. So, that'll be going on. This is going on on Friday, so I'm no longer doing a Smash tournament on Friday, because I know I'm going to lose all my players the moment that Overwatch starts, because all the Smash players also play Overwatch. <laughs> it's kind of the case, so doubles and singles on, on Saturday. I'll do them, like, somewhat back-to-back-ish. But yeah. Yeah, it's a little bit crazy trying to run attorney. Hey, I learned I learned my lesson last year where the doubles tournament started one hour before Overwatch last year. So on Friday, we got like doubles going for about an hour and then an hour in. Look, it's almost done here. Then after an hour passed and they announced Overwatch is starting, I just lost all my players. Everyone dipped, everyone was gone. So this was my little impromptu spot because I couldn't use the stage where I was running Smash, and then every, everyone was gone when I <laughs> when, when Overwatch started. So I had to make the executive decision to make the announcement of, hey, we're pushing doubles to tomorrow. We're doing it on Saturday. This time I'm thinking ahead, and it's just going to be scheduled Saturday. Right now, I'm kind of leaning towards Saturday doubles one to four, and then like singles five to eight, something like that-ish. 
ish. We're figuring it out. And then it'll be posted here. I think Counter Strike is going on as well, from what I've seen on the uh, on the staff schedule. Spoilers, I guess. So, yeah, you play Smash. Glad to hear it. Cause yeah, the more the merrier. So yeah, we'll do the free for all after the opening ceremonies are done. So that'll be like Thursday at nine, and then yeah, doubles and singles on Saturday. But yeah, so this is just my playlist of all my game stuff that I did last year. I was playing a decent bit of Pikmin. Uh, I was playing multiplayer stuff there. You can see late into the night. Some people just game through the night is what some people do. So you can see there's lights out there. Some people will fall asleep in their chairs. Some people actually set up bedding over here and then they sleep like up there on cots and stuff. So that's another thing that some people do. I've always just slept in my vehicle. That has been what I've always done. And here I was playing with Finn and Guzma and Big Chillin. So it's fun to like play some multiplayer games there with friendos and all that. And then I have like the venue cam to show what's going on in the venue. I think this must have been in the morning. It doesn't look like there's many people here right now. Oh, more people are coming in sitting down. I stream a lot during Fragapalooza. It's kind of the case. So. So you are expected to like have a seat to be able to be let in. Have like your little lanyard badge where you have a table spot. Like, I've invited friends before to say like, hey, if you just want to come and play some games, come and play some games. But I might be able to easier get away with that because I'm like, I'm not counted officially as staff, but I come to all the staff meetings. So I'm like basically staff, but not. And my cousin who is staff is so confused about that. He's like, yeah, you're, I don't know why you're not staff staff because you're in all the staff meetings and running things. So I think because I'm in contact with other staff, like I have a little bit more leeway and be like, hey, can I have some people in here or maybe have them help me run the tournaments and stuff? But uh, I think normally you're supposed to have a seat. You can always ask that in the frag discord and ask if it's possible to have people come and visit because it's not really a lot of space at a single table setup. If I go back to Mario Bros here, why is it called Sony Intensifies? I don't even remember. I don't. Oh, this is why we had space, because they had their own table spots. So Guzma was next to me over here, and then Finn was next to me over there. So we had, like, a decent bit of space to be able to scooch down. But one of these table spots is not a massive ton of space. You have enough for, like, monitor, keyboard, computer on the desk if you want it there, as opposed to under the desk. But not really a whole lot else. And, like, places to put food and stuff like that. But it's not a massive, massive ton of space there. Like, I wonder if I send to myself, let's see here, like a photo of the venue just for my camera roll last year. Let's see here, all albums, albums, recents. And I scroll way down to August of last year, where approximately that is. That would be around here-ish very soon. Right? Did I scroll past it? Can't have scrolled past it, right? Nope. I have not. I recognize some things here. And then... Okay, now I went past it. When Guzma and Finn were visiting. Here. Here's some photos of the space that I can find. There we go. Are there any more? Nope, that's pretty much it for the actual table setups. Oh, and here's something else that I can... Uh, that I can post here. Here. So if I go back to my thingamabob here, and then once that's sent, you have to bring a chair too. If you go to one of the mega FPS events, they sometimes have thing chairs, like hard plastic ones at the, at the venue, like just at Fulton Place there. And also I can show how I loaded up last year too. That's what I did. Because I was bringing stuff for a lot of people. Because I brought myself, one of my cousin's kids, Finn and Guzma. So I packed up for four people and I took two vehicles, my car and my truck, <laughs> was the case. And I loaded both of those up to the brim. Hold on. So I'll find that photo too and post it and show what that looks like. So yeah, like chair, desktop monitor, keyboard, mouse. They don't provide chairs, you need to bring a, you need to bring a chair. And it's a pain getting this thing up and down the stairs, but I, I manage it. A chair do be indeed important. Let's see here. When is the picture of how it's loaded up? 
Here it is. Should I black out the license plate on my Fargo? Eh, screw it. I'm sure no one's gonna misuse that. Actually, no, wait. I have individual shots. I can just not use the shot that shows both of them. And just do, like, individual shots that show them with their backs without showing any license plates. Cool. Yeah, so gotta figure out a chair. So anyway. This here. Here's Guzma, here's Finn. So, and then the, there is his little nameplate for his space. So, yeah, this was my computer here that I brought in. And then here's Guzma's space. We were still getting things sorted out, so this wasn't like 100% perfect. And then Finn's space, and then like the separation to like the next table here. This probably is smaller than it would normally look like. I think I was taking up extra space because I had like the two monitors set up as like the main spot for the three of us to game together. Hey, it's done and to like stream stuff. Here he was working on his game there. Um, and there he is messaging me like earlier that I still, I'll check it out after the stream in a stream. So I think I was taking up extra space. So I think this is a little bit misleading, but like here was my spot. So I mounted my microphone there. I got my two monitors. Yeah, I was into Guzma's space. This would have been my spot here, halfway through the table where it's like, but again, you normally can't have two monitors. I have two monitors as like one of the streamers and the person running Smash and stuff like that. Normally it'd just be like one monitor, then you can have like computer there and keyboard and mouse and all that. There's my beanbag chair stuffed underneath. But I was taking up basically all the space with two monitors. I had my computer in Guzma's space. And then he had a little bit less space and then Finn as well with a little less space. But this is what it looks like. And this was like in the morning or something like that. So everyone was like asleep or elsewhere and all the screens were off. So about yay much kind of space. So it's not a massive ton, but it'll get you by. And then there's the stage over there. And I was somewhere around the middle was the case. Oh man, I just selected one of the random photos I saw. That's not a good one, is it? And here was another thing that I selected a photo of. So we'll also just randomly have events that aren't announced ahead of time. Maybe this one was announced ahead of time. I have no idea. It was a surprise to me where it's just like, come out and do this thing if you're interested, like rock, paper, scissors tournament or paper airplane contest. Or this time it was murder ball. This was at like one in the morning or one thirty in the morning, something like that. They made an announcement and they said, we're going to do murder ball in the gym area right next to the one that we're gaming in here. So that's that's what we did. We went out here. We got everyone that wanted to participate lined up and people are just throwing balls until you get knocked out. And if you get knocked out, you go over there and you start throwing balls as well. Apparently, we're not doing murder ball this year. I've heard in the frag meetings. Spoilers there, I guess. We might have to do something else. We might still use this space for something else. But <laughs> there was concerns after last year. There's concerns about adults just completely whipping it at <laughs> little kids that might take it to the face. So... So we're not doing murder ball this year anymore. It was kind of fun last year, but no more murder ball, but we might do something else. <laughs> Maybe we'll see. Cause we do like to do stuff like that. But yeah, and then there was like people watching the murder ball and this going on late at night and all that. So yeah. So unfortunately no more murder ball, but <laughs> we might do something else in that space. So we like to do like random fun things like that. And this is what I loaded up. So here's a whole bunch of monitors for myself and the crew here. I think Guzma and Peyton, uh, yeah, Guzma and Finn just brought a, just brought a laptop since they were just traveling. <laughs> they weren't gonna bring their setups from New Orleans and Germany. Um, but I was bringing a monitor for my cousin as well. What was the case, my cousin's kiddo. And then there's like some blankets and supplies with like, you know, your sleeping stuff and change of clothes and toothpaste and all that. Glad to use a laptop. Yeah, and then a laptop might be easier. And there's a whole bunch of peripherals and all my stuff, and there's all our crap. And then all the chairs just went in the back of my Fargo. Because, like, this is an easy thing where it's like, hey, it's a box of a truck. Let's just shove a bunch of things back there. So I think that's, is it three chairs? Is it two chairs? And then a beanbag chair. Well, it's one, two, three, four chairs, and then beanbag chair. And then we strapped it down. <laughs> and I drove my truck there while Finn drove my car. <laughs> so, so I fully loaded up both my vehicles like to the brim because I was bringing stuff for four people. So I I won't have to do it as much this year. I should just be able to make you know one trip, one vehicle. But I, yeah, I, I filled it up. Also, because this truck has a maximum speed of 80 kilometers an hour, 50 miles an hour, because that's the way old trucks were geared, geared low so it gets more torque, but it gets less speed. 
I had to take the back roads. I couldn't take the highway to make it to the event. I had to take like some dirt gravel roads on the side of the highway. And Finn was driving really close behind me in my car and a rock from my truck put a crack through the windshield of my car because he was really close behind. So that wasn't fun there. But yeah, would suck if it rained on the way. It would, especially with something like this set up here. Also, hello, hello, false souls. Luckily, it didn't. It was fair weather. It was nice. I was able to sleep with the tent in the back of the truck here and I was able to transport chairs and stuff like that just fine. So that worked. The truck didn't break down on me like it did yesterday. Really glad it didn't break down me when going to frag. Yeah, is all done here and the printer's cooled down. I can see what that's like now. I don't know if I'm bringing my truck to frag this year just because it just might not work because it's not working right now. I'll see if I can fix it before then. So I'll gladly throw a bunch of crap in the back here again and then sleep in the back with a tent. That'd be awesome, but yeah. So that's that's frag there, essentially. And then, so it looks like this was the last part last year. I ended with Pikmin as things were closing down. Let's see here on my camera's on. So closing ceremony. Yeah, closing ceremonies were going on. And when closing ceremonies go on, they like to throw out prizes from the stage. So, like, if you're there at the ready, you might catch, like, some shirts or, like, some gaming peripherals and stuff like that. So here I was, like, on my own. It's just completely barren around here. Meanwhile, you can see the massive crowd over here gathered around the stage because there's occasional stuff throwing out. But yeah, there's uh, there's that. That's basically what frag is and what to expect from expect from that. Let me grab this out. This is what I can do. I'm printing all stream to stream here. Yeah, it's a pretty decent tip here. Sometimes I get worried about the actual tips getting a little bit funky as it does in the last few details. But it's actually not too bad. It's not perfect at the tip, but it's not too bad here. I do have to take this out where it's just like, this is just printed like that so that it sticks onto the plate at the bottom a little bit better is the way it's designed. So I can just throw out the bottom here and we can have a look-see at what it looks like. And then this sword will be sent over to Nishara at some point. Because a while back, I still haven't found a good place for this. I couldn't find Pyra and Mithra amiibo around here. They were sold out immediately, and I love Xenoblade Chronicles and Xenoblade 2. But there were ones available in Germany, so he was just like, oh, I'll just send you one. And, uh, like, so this is a German Pyra and Mithra here that he sent me. And I was like, oh, I can pay you back for the shipping. And he was like, nope, don't worry about that. That's fine. I was like, well, if there's something else I can do to repay you, let me know. And he said, like, oh, well, could I recommend a game playthrough? I was like, my schedule is so crazy, especially with wrapping up university. I'm sorry. I think that's like the one thing that I can't promise. So he was like, okay, don't worry about it then. And I do want to repay that. And he very much likes Legend of Zelda. So I wanted to print a Master Sword. So that has been the 3D print project during this playthrough. So that there can be like a print cam on screen during Fire Emblem Fates that slowly brings together this full thing. And the full thing is now done once I rip out all these little bits of plastic here that are just like supports for adhesion to the build plate because otherwise with just like that thin border it might not stick on and might fall over mid print so it's probably a good thing that this prints on there so just throw that all out and I'll grab the main blade there we go mostly clean mostly all cleaned up like that why is there a hole over there oh I guess maybe you can put like a rod or something through if you want that's interesting I didn't know that that was part of the design. All these blade pieces that I've been printing for the last several streams of this on and off. This should now slot onto here. Wow. There we go. Uh, he can slot all the way in when it's on his end. And then, if I grab this from its pedestal here. Pedestal's printed too. <laughs> I mean, it prints a lot of stuff around here. Forgive the random crap on my desk right now. It's been a little bit of a mess lately. Here. There it is. What? If I can, whoops, not hit my apricot. Get the whole thing on camera. There. This whole thing has been 3D printed during the Fire Emblem Fates playthrough here. Very, very slowly. It has been a massive project, but it's a full-size Master Sword. It's just loosely fit together. Like, it's not glued. Because I cannot ship it like this. I'm gonna need to ship it in pieces. This is all glued together. Like, the hard part of assembly is done. And that can just ship as one piece. But I'll just ship the rest of these blade pieces separate, and then he can glue it, is the case. Or he can just leave it unglued and then put it in a pedestal like that. Oh, so, it has been, it has been done. 
Now maybe I want to print one of these for myself. <laughs> this is what I might want to do at some point. Because it is pretty darn cool. Or maybe I'll wait on that because I don't know where I put it. I don't think I have space for it. <laughs> it's kind of the it's kind of the case. But yeah, it's neat. And it feels cool holding it. I think if this was glued together, this would be really cool in like a cosplay. It is a really, really long blade here, so it might be kind of awkward having in like a sheath or something like that. I think there is a 3D model for a sheath for this 3D model of sword. I think. I think I saw one posted. But holy crap, I... <laughs> This, this is already a lot here. My goodness. Oh, there's loose plastic all over the place now. Um, because there was one that I started printing a while back. It's back here. I don't think. If I grab it out. Yeah, this one here. I started printing it with a different plastic for the blade. I did like a light gray. I wasn't sure whether I wanted to do the light gray or this more silvery gray on this one. But this one... The original design is meant to like friction fit together, which means once you slot it together, like which takes some effort to slot together, it'll just have friction, keep it together. But my God, like, I don't know what is up with the design and why it works for so many people, because it sure didn't for me. Because friction fitting stuff together, I cracked several pieces. These hilt guards here, I cracked like three or four of these, just snapped them completely trying to get this together. I would put this in the vise in the garage and try to press it together and it wouldn't press together or it would snap before it got together and there is this one cross guard piece where it kind of didn't print properly at the tops here like that top layer didn't do all that well so one side is better than the other because of that because you can kind of see into the plastic there and i told myself either this gets on or i'm just trashing this whole project and it got on there so i was like oh i guess that works but, i mean even sliding together the blade you can see a crack there and then I think there was a crack down here too. Yeah, there's a crack down the side there from slotting that together because it was way too tight. And I printed the rest of the blade and I slotted it together and it just cracked everywhere and it just completely fell apart. And then I recycled the rest of that blade. And now this thing is just like a showpiece that goes into this pedestal. So there might still be a Master Sword in the background here just because I have this that is only useful as this piece. It's kind of the case. Um, but yeah, it definitely is pretty big here. Or, uh... A lot of the pieces are but i found out when i was looking online that someone designed a loose fit version of it like the same creator there was a whole nother model page where they said oh some people have reported to me that they've had trouble with like the friction fit version so i designed a loose fit version where like it'll slot together but it won't stay together with friction you need to glue it i was like oh that's the thing that i should have been using so this whole hilt is kept together with a whole lot of glue but it slots together beautifully i had basically no issues with it. I had a little bit of issues with it. It still didn't slot together quite perfectly. There are edges where you can see like the line separating the two pieces. It didn't quite slot together perfectly, but it looks pretty good. It assembled a whole lot better. If I ever print another one of these, I'm doing the loose fit version and then just using glue. Because yeah, this is not going to stay together. This falls apart. But with some glue, you can make anything happen. So yeah, I... Is there any way I can stand up the full blade? display it now that we've done it. I don't think it's going to fit into the pedestal. Nope. <laughs> That's not going to work. I don't know where to put this now. And I'll ship it out to Germany when I get the when I get the chance. Huh. I like I can put my one that I'm keeping, my crap one in the pedestal. It could be the set piece now as it once was at one point. The lighter bladed looking thing. And then the nice one, uh, I don't know. So honestly, it makes you want to replay Skyward Swords as you typically technically only got to the final dungeon before stopping two years ago. Oh, geez. Yeah, you got to hold that sword Skyward. If I do, I'm going to hit the ceiling. I can reach up to there. That's a ceiling. <laughs> I can't go super far. With how dark the blade is, this is maybe like a Twilight Princess style Master Sword, you could say. Because the dark blade color. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know where I'm going to put this thing. <laughs> but hey, the printing project of the playthrough is done. We managed to finish it, like, right in time for being at the end of the game, which is really cool. So... I don't know what to do with this thing. I'm going to put it on the back couch. Toss it there. And this will be here for now. Get the crap one back there that you can't tell is crap from this small of a camera shot anyway. Then... Yeah, I don't know. I have a lot of, like, random cool 3D printed doodads around here. Here's another one of my favorite thing, Robobs. 
Just like the title screen of Xenoblade Chronicles, the Monado in the grass. That was a fun thing to print there. Anyway. I'll probably try Chapter 26 a couple times, and then call the stream, and then, like, maybe try Chapter 26 a few more times at Fragapalooza, or something like that, because I know it's going to give me a lot of trouble. Should I start another print? Is there anything that I have that wouldn't be super long that might be fun to print? Oh, I can print a wall mount for the blade that's, that it's supposed to slot into, I see in, like, my Master Sword folder here. Um, I might want to use a different color, though. Might want to use the light gray so it's not like slotting into a similar thing. And then if Nishara wants, you can hang it up on a wall, something like that. Because yeah, it's a, uh, if I turn on display capture again briefly, it's like this. So it's like that on one side and then this on the other side. So you have like the handle through this part here and then the blade can like slot into here. I could print that, maybe. Maybe I'll print it. I gotta heat this up. That's what I gotta do. Try. I can try at least. Where I put my pliers? I put them over here somewhere when I was talking about filing down the apricots, wasn't I? Then where did I put them? Oh, I put them on this little pillow. Here. What I need. I'm off the little tree. All the bits of plastic. So this is the roll that I just used to print the blade out of. Ow, that's still hot. It through so it doesn't tangle. Oh. Something like this. Put it back in the box. Probably look pretty good. That's why I printed this one. I can print another pedestal later. One that maybe turns out better than this. That pedestal didn't turn out super great. Let's see here. Now I can tell it. How about you print that wall mount? Yeah. Where does Fragapalooza take place? Like the address? It's the Leduc Rec Center, if you look that up. I don't know whether it's listed on the website. It should be listed on the website somewhere. Like the actual address. If you look up, like, the LRC, the Leduc Rec Center, you should be able to find it, because it's just in one of the gym spaces there. And that is a whole lot of string out the bottom, as you can see. I forgot my controller was with me. <laughs> my lap. Have that. Because I do not need this getting everywhere. Preferably. I'll grab two pieces one more time before it starts printing. It's still warming up the, the bed. It heats up the hot end super fast since I put a new hot end in there. I put a bamboo hot end in there, which is a specific kind of hot end that's only supposed to work with bamboo printers, but with some engineering with my cousin, I, <laughs> I got it working in my Ender 3 here. There's a bamboo hot end in a Voron tool head, I think it's called, in a modified Ender 3 printer. This is, my printer's weird, but it's, but it's cool that it works. Leduc Recreation Center. Okay, that then. Okay, it is. You're just looking on the in the wrong place. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. But yeah, and it's a nice big hall for it. Like, we have lots of space. Depending on how many seats are sold, if we go into the overflow area, like, there might be more space between the tables. Hopefully there's lots of turnout, and hopefully, hopefully lots of people play in my Smash tournaments. We'll see here. Pull up the game again. Boy. Need those droopies to not get in a... that. Alright, this has been rambling for a while. I guess I'm not streaming anything else tonight after all. Just this. But yeah, I'll start chapter 6 and give it a attempt at least. And uh, I might save doing some of my more, some more of my attempts at frag. I am running my chair over my cables. That is a quick way to damage them and I keep on trying to avoid doing that and it keeps on happening anyway. My headphone cable's long, so I can get out to my 3D printer easily. That's the case. Um, I'm not using keyboard controls. I'm using my controller. What am I doing? Okay. That's all the updates on the trucks, the plants, like my apricot, 
and the Fragapalooza stuff. Hopefully that just works. Sometimes it cancels print before it starts because it's like, could not read the file from the SD card. And I don't know why it gives me that issue. It just can't read the SD card sometimes. Um, so here's hoping that doesn't happen and it just prints because we are going to go into some cutscenes here. Chapter 26, Treason. Nor now controls the Hashidan capital, but the real battle is just beginning. The children of Nor stand together to face a treacherous enemy. Again, this is the chapter that I couldn't clear all those years ago. Doing it without save states because it was on an actual 3DS. So if possible, I would like to be able to beat this map without using save states. Prove that I've surpassed myself from all those many years ago. Because all the way up to the last chapter, I was able to do without save states. Back with the original release. I don't know how with that last chapter because holy crap. But this was the one that I couldn't without losing anybody. And it's not actually going yet. It's just figuring out its axis. So we'll see here. Chapter 26, Treason. 